When you peel back the pre-Columbian history of the United States, you might just find the Book of Mormon. Hidden in the Heartland. Every summer solstice in Adams County, Ohio, there is a celebration that takes place on what is known as the Great Serpent Mound. This is mostly due to the fact that the structure of Serpent Mound, namely the mouth of the serpent, is aligned to the setting of the sun during the summer solstice. Richard Motes explains. The uh, loops of the so-called snake uh, align with various uh, key rise and set points of the sun. The bottom line is we don't know who built it. We don't know for sure when it was built, why it was built. It, it's, it's an interesting feature. It stands out like a sore thumb when you look at all the other geometric earthworks built by the Hopewell and subsequent cultures. It shouldn't be there, but there it is. Serpent Mound is an example of the many earthen structures in the heartland of America that are built with no explanation. It was Motz's experience as an investigator in the Air Force that led him to his interest in what is known as archaeoastronomy. Archaeoastronomy is a technique of analyzing ancient sites, no matter their age, uh, particularly geometric earthworks, uh, works of stone, whether they be walls or the placement of stones, to see if they were intentionally al aligned to certain celestial events. Well, archaeoastronomy is constructing these earthworks to register both lunar, solar, and stellar events. Specifically, uh, events of sunrise uh, and lunar rises and even planets and constellations. One of the most famous earthworks to ever be constructed is in Newark, Ohio, and it was part of the Newark earthworks. And specifically, that is the, uh, the, a large circle and associated octagon mound. And the octagon mound is an eight-sided earthen structure, and the Eight sides of this octagon actually track the cycles of the moon over an 18.6 year cycle called the Metonic Cycle. So these people were masters of understanding the movements of the sun and the moon. Uh, they built another feature there called the Great Circle. It's also aligned to maximum moonrise north. Um, we have other hinges specifically in Indiana here, they're aligned to summer solstice sunrise, um, equinox sunrise, keeping in mind that that is what Stonehenge is aligned to, is summer solstice sunrise. But what we see in other features, and particularly one that I uh, uh, studied for many years in, in northern Perry County, Ohio, called the Yost Works, I see this earthwork uh, being aligned to summer solstice, winter solstice, the two equinoxes, as well as maximum moonrise north and south, and maximum moonrise set north and south. So it was very complicated. Um, it would take me hours to explain all the math and, and, and how I was able to figure that out based on terrain elevations, and it, it gets a little problematic and the complexity, which contained uh, some really serious mathematics. Uh, uh, it's just amazing what these early people were able to do. About a month ago, I just returned from uh, Newark for another documentary that's being shot. And they brought in a surveyor to survey the circle and the octagon. And I asked him, I said, if I wanted to make this earthwork complex today, what degree of mathematics would be required? And he said, you would have to know at least basic trigonometry. We go through history, American history, I mean, who would have known that? But interesting enough, we have tablets from the Amorite period of Babylon, which went from 2000 to 1600 BC, 
and we have tablets of their trig equations. So we know that they were using it. And this mathematics that we kind of, you know, push off onto the Greeks was known a thousand years prior to that. So there's all this mathematics going in there and you say, are these Native Americans or as a historian, do we seek out a people that knew this math? And again, we're back to Babylon. The purpose of the construction of such earthworks is addressed in the book An Archaeology of the Sacred, written by archaeologist Dr. William Romain. Dr. Romain encapsulated this very well in his book. That's virtually the culmination of his life's work. Why did the Hopewell build these enigmatic structures? How do they get so many people to do one thing? And the answer is, is in belief systems. People that are committed to, say, a nation, or committed to their family, or committed to a country, they are all on the same page. But when you look at this aspect of belief system in terms of religion, religion is the power that drives wars, it's the power that drives lives, it's the power that changes lives, but it's also the power under the um, guide of a shaman, a preacher, uh, uh, an elite person in a particular culture where all of the people are bonded by a belief system. Well, they had to um, know these alignments. They had to study these alignments, and it would have probably been within their religious canon as well. So it would have been of importance in their religion that would have you know, brought these people together at these earthwork complexes at these designated times of the lunar and solar events. And what I see in the Yost works is that one of the belief systems is based on what is known as the three-tier belief system. They believed in their terrestrial world, they believed in a subsurface world, the world below. That's water and snakes and fish and, and mythical creatures. And they also saw and wanted to get in touch with the upper world. Well, when you take a look at this three-tier belief system, you have to start to realize that that's what we believe as Christians. We, we believe that we have this terrestrial world. We, when we think of this place called hell or whatever, the bad place, that's below our feet. It's down there. We don't want to go into darkness. We don't want to go there. We want to go there. We often think of heaven to be up there. That's our spiritual belief system of Christians. But the hope while we're doing the same thing. These people were masters. Where did they get this knowledge? And I have come to the single conclusion that this knowledge came by a cultural transfer, a more advanced culture. Who might that be? Well, we know that the Judeo-Christian model was born in the Fertile Crescent of the Mediterranean. It was born in Israel. And right in Israel is a place called Galilee. And in Galilee, the people there carry a haplogroup marker called haplogroup X DNA. And the concentration around Galilee is about 27%. The only other place in the world, other than in the Fertile Crescent around Galilee, where you find a comparable concentration of haplogroup X DNA, is in southeastern Canada, specifically around Nova Scotia, and that concentration is 27%. And when you track the DNA marker around the world, we see that it did not come across the Labringia land bridge, because there isn't hardly any or none in Russia. There's none or hardly any in Alaska. It came directly across the ocean. How did it get here? Ocean navigation. How, do you, how did these early people trans uh, transport or, or sail across the Atlantic. They used archaeoastronomy. They were using the rise and s known rise and set points of the sun in the morning to keep them on course, the uh, set points of the sun at night to keep them on course. Uh, we know that uh, they used the stars by night because they were mastery of what they would see above. In the days of Squire and Davis, much of these ancient monuments were still intact. 
But after years of farming and expansion, preserving these pieces of history was not a priority. So the use of modern technology is used to help in the search for these ancient sites. There are two tools which have emerged in recent technology uh, that is applicable to archaeology. One of them is called LIDAR, Light Detection and Ranging. That's the acronym, LIDAR. And what that is is a low platform, in other words an aircraft, will fly over terrain and it will scan the ground much just like a, a flatbed scanner that you might have at home. It hits virtually every square inch of the terrain as it passes over it with a laser shot. And it receives the reflection of that laser back. So even though tree canopy uh, to our eyes, we can't see the ground, there's enough laser uh, penetration and return that as we manipulate that uh, digital data, we can strip away the foliage and see undulations in the terrain uh, as small as one foot. The other tool that has recently come online is called magnetometry. So in the case of earthworks, what they did is they piled up earth and made these long linear features, circles, squares, whatever. And then along come the, the, the pioneers and the early settlers and they begin tilling the ground and they begin flattening everything out. But still that magnetic signature is left in the ground. In Ohio, a study is done using equipment from German manufacturer Census. The reason we're here is to demonstrate uh, this equipment uh, that has been uh, designed and invented by the Germans. It's a magnetometry array that is about 12 meters, uh, excuse me, about 4 meters uh, wide. Uh, it can be pulled across the ground with a four-wheeler at high speed, uh, looking for uh, anomalies in the natural magnetic field of the Earth. Uh, anytime soil is removed and replaced uh, or deposited on top of pre-existing soil, it changes the magnetic field. And so by detecting those and mapping uh, the, the field, we can see sub surface features that have never been noticed before. Uh, the data got digitized and then uh, sent to a computer uh, where we collect the data and record them and uh, those data are meant to um, form a map afterwards um, once they are imported in our processing software. And then with digital manipulation of that program, we can create a, uh, a picture of the area that was scanned and see all the magnetic anomalies. The LBI case study will provide a seamless map of the terra incognita around Stonehenge. The magnetometer was recently used in an experiment on the ground surrounding Stonehenge building a different view of who might have lived near this ancient earthwork long ago. It was this technology that would be needed in finding the remains of the mysterious menorah mound. Retired economist Hugh McCullough gained an interest in ancient American archaeology from Barry Fell's book America B.C., focusing mostly on the history of the menorah mound. Here, this is a Hopewell earthwork, which seems to depict a Hebrew, uh, Jewish festival. Um, there, there's two types of menorah. This is the uh, nine-branched Hanukkah menorah. Um, there's also a seven-branched temple menorah that's a really ancient symbol of Judaism that goes back 3,000 years. So this is not the temple menorah. But it, because it has nine branches, it's the Hanukkah menorah which has to be after 165 BC, because that's the event that it's commemorating. This particular structure is common with uh, nine branches in a row, with a, one of them standing higher. For 100 years, the archeologists said this was imaginary, because the same, in the same work that the Cyrus Thomas published, 
the Bat Creek Stone upside down, <laughs> um, he discussed plate 34 and Squire and Davis and said, well, it's, Squire and Davis has some problems, like especially plate 20, 34. These things must be imaginary. <laughs> obviously, obviously, this is imaginary. Until recently, the only reference to the menorah mound was a vague image out of the 1848 book Ancient Monuments of the Mississippi Valley. But now, Hugh McCullough has come upon a map from the National Archives, dated at 1803, that confirms this earthwork once existed. So this is the missing original source that proves that it wasn't imaginary after all. And this is totally real. It even works with it. We found this circle up here on top of Milford Knoll even. If we can find where this thing is, and then if we dig at these points, we'll find uh, charcoal, <laughs> because I'm betting that once a year they had a celebration here where they had bonfires at the ends of each of these branches here, which they lit by carrying a, cor a torch from the central one, <laughs> um, lighting one on the first night and two on the second night and so forth. Um, I don't think the, he the Hopewell were Jewish, I think they were Native Americans, but somehow they, there was this community of Jewish people who were taught them this festival and they, they liked it and uh, adopted it as their own apparently. Yeah, you know, with modern technology, if you know where to search, I think the, either the magnetometer or ground penetrating radar could pick it up.